So what I've been asked to cover today is, um, the next slide please, is to talk a little bit about the basic concepts of energy access, energy poverty, and uh, the broader context, and also renewables and women's energy entrepreneurship. Next please. So let's start with uh, access to energy. Uh, the concept of energy is basically, uh, we look at energy as an energy service. So no one wants energy for energy sake, but they want energy for either for lighting their homes or for heating in cold areas and either, or for milk chilling or for some such thing. So it's a service and that's basically the concept of access to energy. And as a service, it's useful only when it's adequate. So you must have a country must produce X megawatts of uh, uh, energy to make sure that all its citizens get it. It should be available when you need. Well, there's no point uh, if you don't have electricity and you are in a tailoring business and you don't have it when you need it. A reliable, obviously uh, reliable in uh, some of the developing countries, including Asia, we had a situation till some years back where uh, we had uh, when many rural remote areas had electricity for two hours in a day. So that doesn't really help you uh, achieve any of the services that you want and some others. So we also talk about access in the context of household level energy use. We also talk about it in the productive use and by productive me we mean not to improve just the quality of life in homes, but also to use it for businesses, to improve productivity, to reduce costs and so on. So you may be replacing um, a grid connection which may be really far off from where you are because the access cost is high you may be replacing that with uh, let's say a solar photovoltaic device which is which is which has relatively lower uh, running cost so that's productive use of energy community use of course is things like uh, schools and uh, uh, you know health facilities etc which are very very important for uh, energy access so um, that really is a concept of energy access. Next, please. And the poverty, when we say energy poverty, it's very clearly linked to the lack of all of these. It's just as simple as that. It's a lack of poverty, lack of, be, uh, lack of energy access for all of these purposes that I'm uh, mentioning. That is it. If you look at uh, the global numbers, next, please. If you look at the global numbers, uh, uh, the world has made huge progress, especially in the case of electrification, but we still have a large number of people who don't have uh, quality electricity. Uh, typically, it is measured in two aspects. Um, uh, one is the access to electricity and one is the access to clean cooking. So when you are using biomass, wood, fuel, fuel wood, cow dung cakes, etc., then you say you don't have quality energy access. So, and if you look at these numbers, in spite of the huge progress that's been made, the numbers are still astounding. So we have almost 790 million people who don't have electricity, which is, which is more than the population of EU put together. If you look at electric, uh, clean cooking, it's even higher. We have 2.8 billion, which is uh, uh, somewhat close to the population of India and China put together. So we still have huge energy access gaps. Next, please. Next, please. What is the importance of this from a gender perspective? Uh, firstly, next, please. And next, please. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So firstly, uh, the numbers are not likely to change in the near future. In by 2030, we have a situation where we still have a huge access deficit, especially when it comes to clean cooking and clean cooking fuels as well as technology. So we're talking about things like improved cook stoves, less, but more about what is called a blend or uh, the, the, the higher order cooking energy technologies like biogas, uh, LNG, uh, LPG, of course, and electricity. These are the four that are considered clean cooking. Why is this important for from a gender perspective, this huge gap? Uh, because obviously uh, cooking is, uh, is, is a link that we all make very intuitively with women. But two points that I want to make here is that um, the exposure to smoke from cooking fuels ex uh, is, is a huge contributor to, uh, to premature deaths. In fact, it's higher than TB, higher than AIDS and many others, and it has been going up. And women and children are, of course, and young children especially, are very, very seriously affected by this. Uh, 
we also have a situation where a very large proportion of people who are collecting wood are women and young girls. And young girls, as you know, do this often at the expense of going to school or being engaged in other productive activities. On the converse, we've seen, and there's numerous research studies that show that electricity can help in many ways, more than just provide lighting for women in terms of uh, scheduling household tasks in terms of just reducing their daily burden of work which is which which is which is huge we all know that in developing countries and this freeing up just freeing up time is a prerequisite for investments in education but it's also important for women to just get rest you know if after a 15 16 hour working day you need rest so your, any time that can be reduced is extremely yes so, please thank you uh, so use of uh, appliances uh, helps uh, helps women a lot in, in numerous ways next please so what is the uh, next slide please ah, so what is the, the current context is really you no know, the previous one yeah the current context is really shaped to a large extent and by the agenda for sustainable development that we are all familiar with. And I'd like to just uh, highlight things uh, from there. One is that it's a very strong and central that all the SDGs are very closely linked and energy is like going that runs through all of them making them possible and second um, key emphasis point is leaving no one behind which is global uh, policy imperative at this moment. It has tremendous uh, progress in terms of energy access, but there are still large populations that are not covered. And it's uh, no surprise to know that these are typically the remote areas, the rural areas, and among them, the low income areas. The easier areas are basically done. So, um, yeah. And uh, like I said before, there has been a fair, a, a huge amount of progress in terms of uh, expanding electrification, particularly. But at this point in the COVID situation, uh, we are actually at the risk of losing many of these gains. In several countries, we are seeing that people are having to give up electric connections because their livelihoods are lost. They're not able to pay uh, for uh, electric connections, the, 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 the ongoing cost of electric connections. We're also seeing homes are being used for uh, not just as, as home, but also as school, as workplace, as livelihood place. In that situation, the, the importance of electricity, I think, has, is, uh, is more important than ever before. Uh, let me also, next please, talk a little bit about the context. In the last 10 years, the context has really changed and uh, it's, it's continuously changing. And one major point has been that renewables are becoming more central than ever before. So the number of people benefiting from renewables in the last decade or so has actually grown sixfold. And it is estimated that as we move into the future, where the connections are going to be more difficult, they're going to be in more remote places, more than 50% of new connections are likely to come from renewable energy sources. Uh, what is also exciting uh, for, every, for, for all of us that who work on these decentralized uh, systems is that this, there's been a huge amount of innovation in terms of business models, in terms of financing systems, ownership model. So we have lease to own, we have digital payments, especially in Africa, digital, digi digital payments is a, is a big thing also in Vietnam. Uh, all of this is also made possible by things like mobile phone usage, better communication, modularity of systems. You can have really small systems now that are uh, very efficient. So all of these really provide a very good backdrop, a very good uh, situation for renewables to work. And of course, we are all familiar with the environmental benefits of uh, renewables. Uh, next. So this, uh, this is, this is a slide I put together for, um, it's linked to the quiz that you had just now. And I was half tempted to answer. Uh, but uh, so it is uh, basically the women's employment in RE sector. So as a whole, the RE sector employs now a fair amount of uh, women. And especially when you compare it to, uh, let's say the utilities, the grid sector, it is much higher. In utilities in South Asia, it's in the range of actually eight to nine to 13% as I would say around the best, but renewables is better. 
However, even in renewables, what you see, like any other sector, is that more women are engaged in administrative positions in, as field workers and much less in technical positions. Even when they are in technical positions, you see them in, uh, in tasks like computer modeling and systems planning and, you know, uh, sales and that sort of thing, and less in hardcore technical uh, areas, though that is, again, uh, uh, rapidly changing now. Uh, organizations are being supportive of women working in the field. Women are also, young women are uh, seeing this as a, uh, as a challenge and want to take on. So I just want to make a make a mention of one thing that, uh, you know, I think in any sector, the career changes come a little bit later than the education changes. So if you look at India, the number of women in colleges and engineering colleges started changing some 20 years back for, 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 for more women. And the career changes is something that we're seeing now. We are also seeing women more at the higher levels, mid levels, decision-making positions. So we are headed in the right direction is what I would say. Uh, next, please. Uh, so if we, yeah. So uh, why one of the very important business models uh, that has come up has been engaging women as last mile distributors and sellers of renewable energy devices and also encouraging them to sell energy for livelihoods like uh, you know renewable energy for agriculture processing for fisheries for cold chains for poultry etc cetera, etc cetera. so why is it why does it make sense well, we have, firstly, there is, we have uh, enough experience now that shows that putting women, money in women's hands offers huge social gains. They're more likely to make investment in children's education, in health, and in other uh, similar social, uh, social gains. Uh, we also see, in, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about energy program, but also others that as women grow and as they increase their uh, business gains, many of them, a large number of them start to take on social leadership roles. In uh, one of our programs in Nepal, a woman entrepreneur actually set up a whole stove, improved stove distribution network in a remote district called Sinduli um, in, in a district. And um, she, she set up the whole system where none existed. And over time, she uh, engaged scores of other women as sales agents. So it was quite a win-win situation for both of them because for uh, Nero, for the for the for the lady distributor, she was able to reach areas that she wouldn't have been able to reach by herself. And for the sales agents, it made sense because they could earn an income without really making an investment. From a business perspective, they're able to reach remote markets, inspire consumer confidence. So why do they uh, inspire consumer confidence? Mainly because they live there. They're not perceived as in the remote areas. So when they sell something, it is a trust-based sales. It is, they're not perceived as fly-by-night operators and they actually complement the private sector in that sense. Next, please. However, we see that uh, they're also hindered by, uh, by, by several factors and all of us who know in who work in the development sector are more than familiar with these uh, aspects. So whether it is access to education, training, information, all of that makes things more difficult for women. So there are more bottlenecks to overcome when you're working with women. We still have discriminatory laws. We definitely don't have proactive laws, if not discriminatory laws. The percentage of women who are uh, banked, who have access to banks and to banking services is, is about 30% less in developing countries than, uh, than others. Next, please. Okay. So uh, now, uh, uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, and I'm talking Talking here from energy perspective, we were probably one of the very few organizations working on women's economic empowerment and energy. Now there are a number of them. And uh, what is becoming clear, it's that it's an approach that works well. It offers multiple gains. However, it's a fairly painstaking, complex, comprehensive process. Uh, you have, uh, I mean, starting with the selection, very careful selection of women entrepreneurs. Who's a, who's a good entrepreneur? Does she have to be educated well? Does she have to have mobile? Um, uh, mobile everyone has. But does she have to have a vehicle? What age group? Should we select women who are part of the group, etc., etc.? So 
all of these are very important programmatic questions. Uh, and uh, what we've seen is that actions need to be combined at multiple levels and multiple uh, and, 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 and multiple, you know, partners. So at the entrepreneur level, there is, of course, there is training, but there's also business development services, but there is also uh, mentoring, continued mentoring, linking with markets, training women to go, you know, to go out there and sell to negotiate tough with uh, suppliers. Sometimes they have to negotiate for resources within their own households. And at the end of the day, they have to have the, uh, what shall I say, the, uh, the grit to go out there and sell. And for that, we find that helping women empowered them about themselves and about their capabilities is extremely, extremely important. So the whole empowerment angle is a very central piece of um, of of this model. Next, please. And Soma, just a quick reminder that you have five minutes left. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. So, uh, like I said, uh, women's entrepreneurship approach is no longer is no longer operating as pilots. Uh, companies like EcoZoom and Dharma Life and many others are actually doing uh, uh, are, are engaging women in very large numbers. Numbers and uh, social benefits is one aspect, but mostly they're doing it because it just makes business sense for the reasons I uh, discussed before. Next, please. Energia has been working on this uh, in uh, seven countries since 90, uh, since uh, 2014 and has worked with almost 5,000 entrepreneurs in all of these countries, uh, 6, 000, over 6,000 people employed and has managed to reach 3.25 million uh, households to date. This number is probably not that significant in the overall scheme of things. But if you look at the profile of the people that are being reached through these pro programs, like I said, remote, rural, and when I say remote, we're really talking about sort of, you know, beyond the bus kind of uh, locations, um, uh, poor, who would not have uh, been able to uh, get energy access otherwise, then it's a huge contribution. Next, please. Yes. So, uh, well, this is just a graphic to show how, what, what are the various impacts. So we have women uh, led uh, uh, micro and small enterprises set up running, running uh, energy businesses. Women in energy businesses gain uh, benefits from improved energy services. So like I gave the example of poultry. And uh, you, so if you, if you replace it with, uh, with an improved energy service, you're reducing the cost, you're increasing profitability, you're increasing control, huh? because these systems are often modular and they are uh, decentralized. Just the control itself is a, is a, is a big gain. And the mu biggest multiplier effect is that the poor populations gain access to uh, clean energy services. This is just a just a graphic example of what what it does. This was one of women we were working in Africa with, and uh, you see, this is this is where she started with, and this is where she has. So she uh, create uh, she was able to systematically create demand. She hired other people to sell for her, which they called with energy are called down, downlines. Uh, started using social media, weekly marketing. Shed, shed uh, she, she she had the confidence to actually set up a, a shed, I mean, to, to, to make use of a weekly market. Uh, she started tracking her profits, costing. Most of these women had absolutely no clue about what their costs and what their, uh, what their, ben what their profits were. So engaging with the county governments, keeping receipts, these are all benefits. And like I said before, uh, these are as individual inputs are very useful. They must always in our experience be accompanied with uh, empowerment in inputs. So uh, yeah, so definitely some of our lessons are that there's a need to move from an instrumental to an a true transformative approach. Women at different levels of uh, business need different kinds of inputs. Partnerships are absolutely central at different levels. And also that a program like this essentially needs long-term support, flexible support, and climate funds today provide an opportunity in that respect. Thank you very much.